If you want to learn how to create your own game in the Unreal Editor for Fortnite, then this video is for you. In this tutorial, you will go from knowing nothing about UEFN to creating this island you see right here. We will start with the basics, like how to navigate and move objects in your 3D world, get thousands of free assets from Fortnite and Megascans, sculpt a landscape from scratch, add lighting to your world, and finally, add gameplay elements like enemies and weapons. Before we begin, it's important to know that UEFN is currently in beta. There are a lot of new features planned for Creative 2.0, so this tutorial will be updated in the future. If this video is already remade, there'll be a link to it in the description. So with all that being said, let's jump into UEFN. To begin, of course, we have to download UEFN and we also have to download Fortnite. So make sure both of them are downloaded within your Epic Games Launcher and then double click on UEFN to open it up just like how we would open up Fortnite. News will be the first thing to open up. We can just exit out of that. And here we have our project browser. Our project browser is where we could create a brand new project from any of these templates, or we could open up any previous projects we were working on. Now I'm gonna to come to Island Templates, and for our first project, let's select Greasy Grove as our template to start from, and let's rename this to First UEFN Project. And when you're ready, click Create to make your project. This is what you will see when you open up the Greasy Grove template for the first time. Now, don't worry, I know everything can look just a little bit intimidating, we will go over what all these windows do in just a second, but first let's go over how we can move around our island. So to begin, if you wanna pan and move your camera, you need to hold down the right mouse button. So hold down the right mouse button to look around. Now, with the right mouse button still held down, we can use the W, A, S, and D key to move around. So make sure you're still holding the right mouse button and with W, A, S, D to move. And we can also use Q to go down and E to go up all the while holding the right mouse button. So again, that's right mouse button, W, A, S, D, and Q and E to go down and up. Now let's say you don't like the speed of your camera. Maybe you wanna go faster or maybe you wanna go slower. Well, you can adjust the speed up here with this button. So just click it and you can bring it down. That's how our camera is moving a lot slower or you can bring it up that's how we're going really fast. Also, if you don't want to have to come up to this button every time you want to change the camera speed, a shortcut for it is to hold down the right mouse button and scroll wheel up to go faster or scroll wheel down to go slower. So that's right mouse button scroll wheel to control the camera without having to use this button. Now here's a tip because this does happen a lot. Let's say that you're flying really far away and then you get lost. You have no idea where your main map is. Well, what you can do is come up here to the outliner, select any of these objects and press the F key to focus. So all you have to do is select an object and press the F key to focus. Also with an object selected, you can hold down the alt button and the left mouse button to then rotate around an object. So first you have to select an object, then press F to focus to it. And then with alt and the left mouse button, you can rotate around that object. With Alt still held down, you can use the right mouse button to zoom in and out. So that's Alt left to pivot around and the right mouse button with Alt held down to zoom in and out. So that's an alternative way to move around. But in my opinion, for the most part, I use the WASD keys to navigate because that is similar to the controls of Fortnite. So we already have the muscle memory there. Now let's go over how we can move, scale and rotate objects. So I'm gonna come over here to this mailbox and to move an object around, first you have to select it with the left mouse button. So you just wanna select it, and you'll see that we automatically get this little gizmo right here. So if you don't get this gizmo, make sure all the way up here, you have this button selected. So now I can hold down the left mouse button on top of the arrow and drag it along the X axis, or if it's green, the Y axis, and it's pretty hard to see, but we also have a Z axis to go up and down. Now you'll notice that there's just a little bit of snapping happening. That's because we have snap to grid turned on. So if you want a smooth translation, make sure you turn that off right there. So now we get smooth movement. If we want to rotate an object, we could come up here to this button and select it right there. So we can rotate it on all its axes and it looks like we also have snapping turned on. So to turn off snapping for rotation, deselect this button. So now we can move that down like this or like that. And if we ever want to, undo a change, you can press Control and Z to undo. 
And right here we have scaling. And as you can guess, we have snapping turned on by default. We can turn that off with this button. So I can scale that up or even make it a really thick mailbox. I'll press Control Z to undo those. And the shortcut is W to move, E to rotate, and R to scale. That's so we don't have to keep on coming up to these buttons whenever we want to make a change. So again, that's W to move, E to rotate, and R to scale. Now, if you want to scale uniformly across all the axes of our mailbox, make sure you press R to go into scaling, and we can hover in between the three squares with this white one in the middle, which will allow us to just scale it up. And we can pretty much scale this as big as we want. So just a massive mailbox in the middle of the town. So I'll press Control Z because obviously we don't want that. And here's a nice tip. If I press W to go into movement mode, if I move my mouse onto the square in between the two arrows, I'm able to move it around in just the X and Y axis, or I could do the same thing with a Z. So I can move it along the X and Z axis, locking it. That's how we're not being moved in the Y axis. So that should come in handy. Now, if I ever want to move an object in the direction it's facing, then I could come up here to this globe icon, select it, and make sure it turns into a square. Now you can see my gizmo just changed. That's how I'm able to move it in the direction that the mailbox is facing. Now, if I ever want to get back my original gizmo, I can click right here to get back the global axis to where it was originally. All right, so let's go over how we can duplicate objects and select multiple objects. So to begin, we can duplicate an object. You just want to select any object and press Control and D to duplicate. Now, you might notice some flickering and nothing really changed. That's because the duplicated object is on top of the original. So if I just drag this out, you can see that we have a brand new object. So you just select any object, Control D to duplicate that and drag. Also, a shortcut is to hold down Alt and drag. So holding down the Alt key and then dragging will also duplicate. So again, that is Alt and drag to duplicate an object. Now, to select multiple objects, you want to hold down the Shift key and left click on an object. So Shift key, left click will allow you to select multiple objects. And now you can move them around or rotate them all at once. If you ever want to deselect an object, you can hold down Control and click. So now those objects are no longer in this selection. And finally, two last things I'm going to go over that have to do with moving objects around, and that is snapping to the floor. Since if I just move up this object, and I want this object to, let's say, go directly into the road, I'm going to have to line it up and try to make it as precise as possible. And obviously, that could be a huge hassle since we're going to be manipulating hundreds of objects. Instead, if I just want to snap it to the ground, I can move the object up and press the N key, so the E and D key to snap it to the ground. So with any object, I can just move it up and press E and D to snap it to the ground. Now, let's say I want to move my object across the map. Well, the way I would do that was that I would first have to drag it and then go find out where it is again. It's in the bush, drag it again and again. And that's also a hassle. What I could do is hold down the shift key and then drag, which will lock my camera to an object. So that's shift and drag to lock the camera to the object, which also makes creating worlds a lot faster. And of course, if you ever want to get rid of an object, let's say we're done with this trash bin. It's been helpful. We're going to have to say goodbye. Then you could press backspace or the delete key to get rid of it. Now it's on to the really fun stuff, and that is adding in brand new objects into our map. So there's two ways. The first way is up here, and the second way is with the content drawer. So let's first go up here to the add button. And if we scroll down, we can drag in any of these objects. So if I go to basic shapes, I can drag in just a sphere and make that really big. Or if I go to, let's say, a dark location, like within this house, I can click on the add button and drag in a point light. To go ahead and illuminate this room. So that's the first way of adding an object. But as you can see, we're pretty limited at what we can drag in. What we really want to do is add in one of the thousands of objects that Unreal Editor for Fortnite comes with. And we could do that down here in the content drawer. So the content drawer contains everything that is inside of our project. 
So if I click on the folder with our project's name, these are all the files that we control. But I can also click on Fortnite, and here are all of the assets that make up Fortnite. So this is five years worth of different objects. For example, I can come up here and type in temple, and then it's gonna go through and find all these different temple assets that I can just hold down left mouse button and drag into my world, just like that. I can also, let me go find a really clear space like right here, scroll down and let's also drag in this massive pyramid. So we could just dump a large pyramid right next to our town, just like that. And I could go through and edit any of these assets to make our own temple. The shortcut to show the content drawer so we don't have to come down here and press this button every time we want to drag in an asset is control and space. So whenever you want an asset, press control and space and you get access to all of Fortnite's assets. It looks like it's searching for assets with the name temple. So if I click on this X, then we go back to our normal folder view. It's incredible that we have pretty much thousands of different assets and gameplay elements that we can play with. For example, if I go into weapons, then I can drag out an assault rifle, which the player can now pick up. It's pretty incredible how many elements that are part of Fortnite we have available to us. We can probably spend 10 hours going over all the available assets that we can use. For example, if I go to prefabs, this gives us massive buildings that we can drag out. Like let me go to deserted fortress and let's add a fortress right next to my town because I feel like it needs one and just drag it in like this. It is pretty crazy that we get this amount of power within the editor. We didn't have to create any of these assets. It just came with UEFN. Now here's a really important tip. Let's say we want to see all the assets we have available to us. Well, right now we can't because we have to double click on a folder to go into it and click on that folder. And maybe these are the wrong assets. So then I have to click back out into the main Fortnite folder. What I can do as a shortcut is click on this icon right here and all the way down here under miscellaneous, I'm able to click on Fort Playset Prop Item Definition and also come right here to miscellaneous and click on Fort Playset Item Definition. Also go back to that same menu and select Fort Item Definition and also select Fort Trap Item Definition like this. So I know that's a lot of selections, but now if we select the Fortnite folder, we see all the different assets and gameplay elements that are available to us. And this is probably thousands of different assets we're all able to use, which is incredible. No game engine just comes with this many assets right off the bat. Honestly, we could probably spend 10 to 20 hours going over all these different assets. I highly recommend you to go through the content drawer and just see what is available and maybe play around with a lot of these assets to know what they do. Now, if you ever want to get back your original view, you can select the filters to toggle them off just like this. So now we have our original view. Now let's say I want to go into props and I want to see all the assets that are available to us within the prop folder. Then all I have to do is just reselect these filters and I can see them without having to go into additional folders. So that's a little shortcut that could definitely speed up your workflow. Now we don't just have access to the thousands of assets that Fortnite come with. We also have access to thousands of assets we can download for free off of Epic Games service called Fab. To do so, we want to click on this button up here and select Fab. So this is Epic Games service where we have a bunch of different items that we can buy or free items that we can use. So we could just scroll around and see what's available to us, or we could come up here and let me type in rock and we get access to hundreds of different rocks we can use. Now, if you want to filter for the assets that are free, then you could go to base price and select free. So all these assets don't cost anything. And let's say I really like this reddish rock right there. Well, if I want to use it in my world, all I have to do is simply hold the left mouse button and drag it into the environment. Unreal will automatically download it and place it into my world just like this. So it's pretty small. Let me press F to focus on it. And now here we have our rock that I can scale up and we can do this with any of the assets we find available to ourselves.
So this is how you would create a realistic environment in Fortnite is with all these free assets. So maybe I also want an Apple, drag that in, wait for Unreal to download it. And this Apple is way too small, so I can just scale it up. And we have a massive Apple that's right next to our temple, right next to our town. So our map is looking pretty bad, but that's a joy of UEFN. You can pretty much do anything and let your imagination run wild. Now we know how to bring assets in. Let's go over how we can control our viewport. So the different options up here and just how to view our world. So to begin, probably one of the shortcuts I use the most is the G key. So you notice that when we're in editor that we have all these little widgets. So we have this light widget right there and we have this massive box that is surrounding the entire island. Well, if you ever want to get rid of these widgets, that's how you only see what the player is going to see in game. Then you could press the G key to turn on game view mode. So now we don't have any more widgets. And this is basically what the player will see. If we press G key again to toggle it, then we bring back our widgets. Something I do constantly whenever I'm creating environments is to press the G key to temporarily hide the widgets. And then press the G key back if I have to select any of my widgets. So just keep in mind that I will be throughout this entire tutorial constantly pressing the G key over and over again to hide and unhide these widgets. Now we can also change our field of view. So maybe you think the field of view is a little bit too constraining. You want to see some of the size of the camera. Then click this button up here and you can increase the field of view like this. And now we have a field of view of 120 and the default is 90. So generally I like to keep it at 90. I can also toggle immersive mode or I can press F11 as a shortcut to have a full screen view of my world. So I can edit my world without the distraction of different windows to the side. So that's F11 as the shortcut. Now, if I want to view a top down bird eye perspective of my world, I could click on the perspective button and select top just like that. And you'll also notice that it's going into wireframe view mode. So I could go to left or to see a front view and I can hold down the right mouse button to pan and the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. I can click on this button again and select perspective to go back into my normal view. Now up here we have lit and I could go unlit to see what my world would look like without any shading or lighting. And I can also click on wireframe to see basically what polygons make up my world. So I can see how dense the object is or how many polygons are in an area in case I want to optimize the spot. I can see just the lighting of my world by clicking on lighting only. I think this is really cool for debugging. So maybe you have a light and it's acting weird. So you want to see what it's doing. Then you can toggle detail lighting right there. And this is probably the most important one that is player collision. These are all the collision volumes that will block the player. So if it's ever the case where your player is stuck or something is blocking it and it shouldn't be, make sure you go into player collision to see if you do have any collision that is blocking the player. Now I'm going to leave it just at lit for now. And we also have the show flags. So show flags allows us to turn on and off different settings. So for example, maybe I don't want fog in my world. Then I could click the fog icon right there to see what my world will look like without fog. Now this doesn't mean the player won't see fog. They will still see fog. This is just a good way to turn it off when we're editing in case one of these options are in the way. Also a common issue a lot of people encounter is that their landscape is missing. So they open up a world. They can't see their landscape. They don't know why they can't click it. We'll make sure in the show flags you don't have landscape uncheck. And we can also change the time of day up here. So with this button, I can bring the time down. That sounds kind of like sunsets. Or I can even just make it nighttime, which is pretty neat that we can very quickly see what different times of day will look like in our environment. Now let's go over what all these panels do and how to customize our user interface. So to begin, in the top right-hand corner, we have the world outliner. So the outliner shows all the objects that make up my world. For example, I can select any of these objects, for example, downtown trash can, and then it's going to select that in my world all, all the way over here. Or I can come over here to the Apple and select it. And you'll notice that's also selected in the world outliner. Now, if I want to hide an object 
All we have to do is come to the outliner and select this eye icon to hide it. So it will temporarily hide it. And then I can press on the eye icon again to bring it back. Also, the shortcut for hiding objects is to select it and press the H key. So select the rock, press H, and then press Control and H to bring back those assets. Now, the next window that's right below the outliner is the details panel right here. So the details panel contains a bunch of settings and properties of whatever object we currently have selected. So for example, instead of, let's say, scaling up in the Z axis through our gizmos, we can scale it right here. So make this like 200. And now we have a really long apple. Or this is especially useful for lights. So let's come over here to the original light we created through the add menu. And I can select this light and maybe bring down the intensity to four. And I think whoever lives in this room loves LED lights. So select the light color and we can make this reddish just like that and press OK. I can also soften the shadows. So hopefully you can see the shadow right here that's being cast by the bed by increasing the source radius. So if I increase that radius, you'll see that we get a softer and softer shadow. So that's what the details panel does. It's pretty self-explanatory, but what if I want to customize my user interface? So let's say I want my details panel to be on the left side of my screen. Well, I can hold down the left mouse button and drag it from its tab. So make sure your mouse is hovering over the tab and then drag it over here and let go. So to move windows around, all you have to do is hold down the left mouse button and drag it off just like that. And now our outliner is floating. I can also drag it. That's us right next to the details panel. So I can switch in between details and the outliner. Now let's say if I accidentally destroy my user interface to the point of no return, I want back the default user interface. Well, what it can do is come to windows, low layout and select default editor layout. This will bring back the default settings, which honestly I like. Another thing I could do is add in new windows. So if I come to windows and select place actors, we get a brand new window I could dock anywhere. So something a lot of people like to do is add the place actors to the left side right here. That's how they can very quickly, let's say drag in a new object. Now, generally, I don't like the place actors window because I get all the same functionality from the add menu right here. So to get rid of any windows, just hover over the X and select it like that. Now let's go over how to edit the landscape of our world. So I'm going to fly over here and it looks like we have this massive fortress that's in the way and this fortress is made up of prefabs. So if we select any of these individual elements, you can see that they're all different objects. So I can't just select one and delete it because then it only deletes that object. Instead, to delete this prefab as a whole, I have to type in the name of it up here in the outliner. So this was deserted fortress and then select that. So this will select all the elements that make up that prefab and simply press the delete key or the backspace key to get rid of that. Just like that. So now let's go into landscape editing mode and to switch modes, we can do so up here with this tab. So if I select this tab, we get a drop down, and then I can select landscape mode. So this entire time by default, we've been in selection mode. Now we are inside of landscape mode. And the shortcut for landscape mode is shift and two. And then if I wanna jump back into my original mode of selection, which is what we've been using, I can press shift one. So shift one for selection mode and shift two for landscape mode. So in order to start sculpting, make sure you're in the sculpt page right there, not manage or paint, make sure you're in sculpt and you have the sculpt brush selected. Also down here, you can see we have a bunch of layers and you'll notice that the only layer that's not grayed out is details and painting. So at least for this map, make sure this layer is selected because you won't be able to sculpt if you have these layers selected. So with details and painting selected, I can hold down the left mouse button and I can start to sculpt. Now I can also hold down shift to sculpt down. So just left mouse button will bring my landscape up and shift will bring it down. We can also smooth out my landscape by clicking on the smooth button right here. So then I could just smooth it out like this, or maybe we have gameplay elements or I want to build a house right here. Then I can use the flatten brush to flatten out 
this entire area. That's how we don't have any bumps in the landscape. And of course I could go into sculpt and increase my tool strength. So my brush is a lot more powerful. And here's a tip if you ever want just a lot of noise in one spot, then I could go into noise right there and I could increase my brush size right here. So I could just make that really big and okay, press control and Z. So make sure our tool strength isn't one. If I click on this button, it'll bring back the tool strength to 0.3, which is its default. And then if I just start clicking, we can see that we get random noise on my landscape. So that's a good way to add nice natural variation. I'm gonna press control Z to undo those changes. And here's a shortcut. If you ever wanna change the size of your brush, then you can use the bracket keys. So left bracket to make the brush go down or right bracket to make it larger. So that's left for down and right to make it larger. Or of course you could change it right here. Now another setting is the brush fall off. So let me go right here. And I'm also gonna bring down the brush size. So by default, your brush's fall off is a 0.5, which basically gives a slightly smooth brush. If I, if I bring this down to zero, then we're gonna see we have a very harsh sculpt. Or if I bring this up to one, then we have a smooth sculpt. So keep it in mind that the settings you'll be changing the most is the tool strength, brush size, and brush fall off when you're sculpting a landscape. Now let's go over how we can paint different layers. So if I select the paint layer, we get access to all of these different layers. So if I come back over here, you'll see that we have sand by the beach. Maybe I want this beach to just be a little bit bigger. Then I can select sand and details and painting selected. I can hold down the left mouse button and make an even bigger sand beach. Or I can add in mud right here by selecting mud and let's go add mud just in this area. Now you notice I wasn't able to paint mud where the sand is and that's because the sand is above the mud. So if I ever wanna get rid of a layer, make sure you have that layer selected and then hold down shift. So now we can cut away from the sand all the way back to where it was originally. So this is really useful. For example, let's say if I wanna make this asphalt road even longer, then all I have to do is select asphalt. I'm gonna go bring down the brush size with the left bracket key and hold down the left mouse button to paint an even longer road like this. So landscapes are pretty easy to use. Later in this video, I'll go over how to use the manage tab and how to create our own landscape completely from scratch along with the ocean. But for now, let's go over how to play our map directly inside of Fortnite. And to do so is really easy. All you have to do is come up here to launch session and select that, which will automatically open up Fortnite and load us into the map for us. And here I am in Fortnite. If I turn around, we can see that this is the map we've been editing this entire time, which is really cool how we can just see the environment we've been working on. Also, automatically we replace at the player spawner. So whenever we play our game by pressing the escape key and selecting start game, we'll start off right here. And if you want to jump back into Unreal Engine within the escape menu, you can hover your mouse over at the top right here and hold down to go ahead and minimize this window. We can also make this window smaller. That's how on the bottom left hand corner, we have Fortnite and up here we have Unreal Engine. So within the outliner, if I type in player start and I can either double click on it or press the F key to focus to it. It is this location right here that we are currently at. Now, here's the really cool thing about the Unreal Editor, and this is something that Unreal Engine 5 doesn't have, and that is we can play our game in Fortnite while live editing. So let's say I don't like where this spawner is. Well, I could jump back into Unreal Engine 5 right here and simply move it. So let me move it. That's how it's all the way over here and press the N key to drop it to the ground. And if I jump back into Fortnite, let me go make Fortnite even bigger. I can run over here or double tap space to fly. You'll now see that our player spawn is all the way over here. So whatever edits we make inside Unreal Engine will also be shown within Fortnite. So again, another example that I can do is let's come over here to our Apple 
And let's make it really big. I'm going to make it, let's go 500 by 500 by 500. And now within Fortnite, I can just double tap to go and fly. And we have a massive apple. So you can have people edit your map directly inside Fortnite and have other members of your team edit that map within Unreal Engine. So whatever changes you make in Fortnite will be shown in Unreal Engine and any changes you make in Unreal Engine will be shown in Fortnite, which is pretty crazy. It allows for rapid prototyping and it'll just make the entire process of creating your game a lot faster. Also, when you come up to devices or gameplay elements within Fortnite, let's jump in right here. You're able to press the E key and you get all these different settings which you can change on the device. Now, you can also change those settings directly inside Unreal Engine. So let me go select that same device right here. Select that. And within the details panel, we get all of those same settings. So let's say, for example, the player team property within the player spawner. I want to set this to team index the second team, so team index two. And you'll immediately notice that it changes to red to show that it is team index two. Or I can press E to change that exact setting right here. So maybe instead of two, let's set it to 10 and click OK. Now you'll notice that the settings within Unreal Engine was also set to 10. Not only does this live editing apply to props in our world, it also applies to gameplay elements and the details panel. So you could theoretically make a large portion of your map in Fortnite. Although if you want to work faster and have access to more tools, then you should spend your time in UEFN. This is the coolest part of the editor. Unreal Engine 5 doesn't have this ability. And if we want to play our game, let's first set the player team to any. That's what we're going to spawn right here. And simply press start game. So we will start the game and spawn at this location. So now we are playing the game we made inside of Fortnite. I can also end the game. And instead of pressing start game right here, I can also press start game within the editor, which will start it within Fortnite. So those are two ways to start. Now that we know the very basics, like how to navigate and move objects in our world, it's time to create our own custom island completely from scratch. To do so, let's create a new project. To create a brand new project, we first have to open up the project browser. So we could exit out of Unreal Editor and reopen it to get the project browser back, or we could come up to File and all the way down here under New Open Project. So this is our project browser. We could go to Island Templates, and we're going to start off with a completely blank island. So you can name this anything. I'm just going to name it Mountain River Valley, just like that, and press Create. This is what you will see when you open up a blank project. All we have is two player spawners, a floor, and Unreal Engine's default lighting. Now, if you don't want the default lighting and you want to have your own custom lighting, first, I'm just going to add in a light to show this off. So all we have is one light in our world. In order to turn off Fortnite skylighting, you need to come up to Windows and first grab the world settings. And within the world settings under time of day, we have disable all time of day management. Just select that right there. And now we turn off UEFN's default lighting. So in case you want your own lighting setup, this is how you would do it. But for this project, I like the default lighting, so I'm going to keep it. To create a landscape, we're just going to zoom out really far and switch from selection mode to landscape mode. Now, instead of selecting sculpt, as you can see, we have no landscape. We're automatically going to put it to the manage tab and we're going to use the new tool to create a brand new landscape. So generally, I just like to leave everything at default. So don't change anything here and click on create. Now, if you think your landscape is maybe too big or too small, we could jump back into the Manage tab and click on the Add button. So this Add button will allow us to add in more components to the landscape. So if I hold down the left mouse button, I can basically paint to make my landscape even bigger. Or I could use the Delete tool to delete parts of my landscape in case I think it's too big. I'll press Control-Z to bring that back. And let's go into the Sculpt mode. Now, I'm just going to sculpt a little bump in the middle of my landscape, which will be the main bulk of my island. So using the right bracket key, let me increase my brush size and let's just start making some random hill areas right here, just like that. And now, of course, we need to add an ocean. 
because when we look out into the distance, it's just an empty blue void. We want that to be an ocean. So to add an ocean to your world, press control space to go into the content drawer and under the Fortnite folder, select environments and select water. So here we have our ocean, simply drag that out like this. And then we can immediately see we have an ocean, but our landscape kind of disappeared. If we go underneath the ocean, this is where the landscape is. So by default, the ocean will automatically affect our landscape. Now, if I exit the ocean, you'll notice that right here, and hopefully you can see it, we have these little square pegs that we can select and move around to tell the ocean how big we want our island to be exactly. Now, if you don't see these pegs, make sure you press the G key to go out of game view mode. So that is a common issue is that people don't see the path, so they have no idea what to click. You just wanna make sure you press the G key to bring out your widgets. So let me go make that just a little bit bigger like this. And for some reason, let's say you don't want the ocean to automatically affect your landscape. Then you can go into the details panel of your ocean and scroll down under terrain, affects landscape, make sure that's turned off. So now we get back our original landscape that wasn't affected by our ocean. So this is our landscape before our ocean, and this is our landscape after our ocean. So honestly, I think this is fine, but it does need to be bigger. And then I'm gonna go in with the sculpt brush for my landscape and bring everything back up. So let me go bring everything up. That's how the majority of the landscape is above my ocean because right now it's below like this. Also use the smooth brush and just smooth it out. Okay, our island is slowly starting to come along. Another thing I'm gonna do is go into the paint mode and actually exit my landscape mode, go back into selection mode, select the ocean and press H to hide it. That's how using shift two to go back into landscape mode Using the paint tool, I can select layer three, which is our sand, and increase my brush size, so it's really big, and start to paint sand where the water is. Because obviously, this type of grass doesn't grow below the ocean. So I'll press Shift F1 to go back into selection mode, and Control H to bring back my water, and now we have a nice beach environment. Also, what I'm going to do, is make my island bigger by selecting those pins again. Now, it is really hard to select those pins if you are having a hard time selecting them. You could come up to Lit and select Wireframe, and then you can grab it just like that, and then go back into Lit. So what I can also do is rotate this to change the curvature of my island. So now we have a really sharp curve going down right there, or, I can also scale it up with the R key to make it rounder. So that's what I want to do. That's how it's not like a triangle, but more like an actual island, which is a circle. I'm also doing a pass with the sculpt, smooth, and flatten brush to make the transition between the beach and the cliffs a little bit more natural. And within the paint mode, make sure layer three is selected, which is our sand. And I'm going to hold down the shift key to cut away my beach because I think the beach is just a little bit too big. Now it's time to add in a river. And I think this valley right here is a good spot to put it. So press control space and within the same location under Fortnite, environment, water, we have the river tool. So drag it out just like this. And it's important to zoom in on it. That's how we can see which direction the current is flowing. So the current is flowing this way, which means we wanna rotate it that's how that way is facing the ocean. Because obviously it doesn't make sense for the current to go upstream. We need it to go downstream like this. And come over here, select that, and try to angle it or position it so that we have a smooth transition into the ocean. Now you'll notice that whenever I move my river around, our landscape changes with it. And just like with water before it, if we don't want it to change the landscape, then within the details panel under terrain, make sure effects landscape is turned off. So that means we have to manually go in here with our sculpt brush and try to cut a path for the river. Now, in my case, I do want the river to affect the landscape. 
So make sure that's turned on. Now let's say I want a new point. All I have to do is hold down Alt and drag from the last point. So just like copying objects, you want to hold down the Alt key with one of these points selected to create a new point. Just like this. So Alt, drag to create a new point. I'm press Control Z because really all I need are three points. Right now I'm adjusting the landscape with the Sculpin Smooth Brush to try and make the transition between the river and hills smoother. Now, just like beforehand with the ocean and sand, if we zoom in on our river, it doesn't really make sense for grass to grow here. So what I would do is within sculpt mode paint, select layer six, which is our rocky pebble layer and start to paint down just a pebble floor for the river all the way into the ocean. And here's a tip. With my paint selected, I could bring down the tool strength to something really small, like 0.05. And then if I increase my brush, I could just do really light touches. That's how we get a much smoother transition between the grass and the pebbles. So I can just add just a little bit of a smooth transition around my river. So that's how it's not as abrupt. All right, before we move on, I want to point out how we can increase our grass's spawn distance. Since right now, if I, let's say, come over here, and if I zoom in to the top of this hill with the C key, so that C to zoom in, you'll notice that we have no grass up here. That's because there's a limit to where the grass can spawn. If we want the grass to spawn even further, then we can increase our settings by coming up here to the settings icon, under engine scalability settings, change it from epic to cinematic. So now this is the best quality possible, and we have grass spawning on top of the hill. This is also going to know if you have a low frame rate, you can lower Unreal settings right here to get back performance. Or you can even come up here and change it from cinematic back to its default of epic. So for the rest of the video, I will leave it at cinematic. Now let's start decorating our world by placing in different props. So we're going to start off first with our cliffs, rocks, trees, foliage, and then we're going to move on to the buildings. And finally, we're going to end it by adding in some gameplay elements. So to begin, let's go over what assets Fortnite has for us that we can use. So press Control and space. And just like beforehand, everything we're going to see is within the Fortnite folder. So you totally could activate all the filters that we set up and then look through every single asset and see which ones you like and want to use. Or something I like to do is to go into prefabs and see what Epic Games has already created for us. So if I click on Fort item definition, and Fort playset item, I can see everything that we can use. So let me go to Pirate Inn. I'm gonna come over here to the coast, press Control Space, and drag in Pirate Inn. So you can think of prefabs as completed Lego sets. So it's not just one object, instead it's a collection of pieces or Lego bricks that we can connect with each other to create a larger set as a whole. And all the assets in the prefab folder are these larger sets created from pieces. Now, if you also want to, let's say, use an asset that you like, what you could do is come up to that asset, for example, this cart, right click on it, and then select browse to asset. This will jump to that asset's location in our content browser. So here it is. Now I can just go back and drag it out. So again, you can right click on any asset, select browse to assets, and then it will jump to that location. In our case, this barrel is under haunted, under props within the Fortnite folder. And a shortcut for it is control and B. So control B to browse to any asset that you have selected. Right now, all of these objects are connected to each other as part of this prefab. If you ever wanna move this prefab around or delete it, then you need to select one of these objects and within the outliner, scroll up until we see the object that connects all of them. In that case, it's Pirates Inn. And we can double check that all these assets are under Pirates Inn by clicking on the triangle right there to collapse all those objects within the outliner. So if I select Pirate Inn, now I'm able to move this around or even rotate it. I can also just delete it with a delete key. So I'm press Control Z to go back because that's just a reminder. Let's say if we do have an asset that we like, we grabbed it from the prefab 
and we're using this object somewhere else in the world, then if we delete the prefab, then this asset will also be deleted. So to basically unlock an asset from the prefab, that's how we're able to use it. You wanna right click on that asset, go to attach to, and then select none. So now this asset is no longer in our prefab. So if I scroll up again to the main prefab, which is part in and delete it, that object won't be taken with it. Also, do not forget that a lot of Fortnite assets are built on a grid system. So that means if I select one asset and copy it and try to stick them together, I have to try to get it exactly just like that. And that's a huge hassle. Instead, what we can do to stick assets together is to come up here and enable grid snapping. So now if I move this object around, you can see that's automatically snapping to the grid for us. And if I copy this or use another asset that also sticks to the grid, then they will automatically stick with each other just like this. So I don't even have to do anything. The objects are automatically snapping to the grid and each other for us, which makes the process of building up sets a lot faster. Also, you could change the snapping size all the way up here next to the snapping icon. So click on the four, and now we have a drop down, so I can make this 64, so we have a lot quicker snapping. And if you ever want to turn off snapping, that's how we're just able to move this object around without it snapping to the grid. Then you could toggle it off by clicking on that button again. Now, here's another tip for moving objects around. Let's say you have multiple objects that you want to move around as a group. Instead of having to hold down shift and select multiple actors each time, what you can do is press control G to group them. So now whenever, let me go select away, whenever I select one of these objects, I select the entire group and can move it around. Now, if we ever wanna get rid of this grouping, I can right click, go down to groups and select ungroup right there. So that's a shortcut to create groups. That's how we don't have to continually select these objects all over again every time we wanna move them together. For this project, I'm only using the assets that are included in Fortnite. If you really want to, then you could come up to Fab and download one of the thousands of high quality assets that are free. So you could use those, or you could even import your own objects. I will have a separate video soon going over how to import and create your own objects and materials. But the only issue with importing objects is that it then increases your project's file size. And Fortnite Islands have a file size limit of 400 megabytes which is a little bit under half a gigabyte. So if you ever wanna see your project size, you can come up here. Right now, it doesn't know what the size is since we first have to upload it, which we will do later. So that's why using Fortnite assets are good because it keeps your project size under 400 megabytes. In the future, hopefully Epic will change that and increase how much memory an island can have. To begin our build and placing objects, we're first gonna start off with the really big changes. So your rocks, cliffs, and trees. And then after we handle those big changes, we're gonna move on to the really small stuff, which is like grass, ferns, foliage, and finally the building. So if I press control space to bring up the content browser, let me scroll all the way up and make sure I have Fortnite selected. Because whenever we use a search bar, it's gonna search whatever folder we have selected. So if I have this folder selected and type in rock, we're not gonna get any rocks, but if I select Fortnite, we're gonna get all the assets with the name rock inside of them. So let's go see exactly what I like. And it is modular rock right there. So let's drag that out. I'm grabbing all the rock assets I think will look nice in the environment. Something I recommend everyone to do before you start to build is to find assets you think might work in the environment. Drag it into your world to preview it. And if you don't like it, delete it and see if the next object would look better. These are the rocks I think will fit well in the environment. But before I start placing them, I first want to handle the waterfall because I want there to be kind of like a second river or maybe a pond that has a waterfall leading into the river. So to do so, let me press control space, make sure the Fortnite folder is selected. So we search that and type in waterfall. Okay, I can grab any of these waterfalls. Let me just grab this one right here. And let me try to maybe scale it up a little bit. Another thing I want to do is add in a rock wall. So type in rock wall to drag out this wall right here because it doesn't make sense for the waterfall to just be by itself. It needs to be flowing from somewhere. 
And I'm also going to go back to the waterfall and add in a particle effect. So let me grab this particle effect right here and angle it so that's how it's in the direction of the waterfall. Now, another thing I'm going to do is add water up here. Now, I could create another river, but I find that having two rivers right next to each other can be a bit cumbersome. Also, I want complete control over my sculpting in this area. And if I have two rivers, it's going to make it a little bit harder, even if I have a river that is not affecting the landscape. So let me go ahead and type in water. And we're going to grab this water down here. So I'm going to drag it out and see if it matches the original water. And it does. So we're going to place it right below the waterfall. That's how this waterfall is coming from this pond or river. I want to rotate this exactly 90 degrees. So temporarily, I could turn on rotation snapping, rotate 90 degrees, and turn it off. So let me move it like this, increase it, and make that even longer. Now, just because we're done with the majority of the sculpting doesn't mean I can't still go in and touch up some areas. So I'm sculpting out the pond right here to make it just a little bit wider. Now I'm getting the rocks and placing them along the water and cliffs. Personally, I don't like how flat the default landscape cliffs are, so I like to add rocks to the cliff areas to make it more three-dimensional like real cliffs. If you are following along with this tutorial, I highly encourage you to not follow what I'm doing exactly and to create your own unique environment or variation of this one. The fact is that there are hundreds of assets from medieval castles to cyberpunk buildings that you can pick from, not to mention all the objects you could get from Fab. Truly, your only limitation is your imagination. The best way to learn is by creating something unique. Also, here's a tip. Let's say if you scale the rock or any asset and you want to set it back to its original scaling, then you could come over to the details panel and click on this little arrow right here next to scale, which will set it back to its default value. You could also flip any assets within the details panel, scroll down and select mirrored right there to flip an asset. You can see that I am placing rocks as if they are popping out of the cliffs of the river valley. This really helps to add unique variation to my environment, and I think it just looks nicer to look at. Environment creation in UEFN is 90% moving simple objects around. There isn't any secret. The majority of the time, you are just moving, rotating, and scaling objects until you think its position looks nice. While some people might think the process is boring, I personally love to just zone out, turn on music, and build a simple world. Now that my landscape is starting to take shape, I think it's time to add in a log cabin. Now, you don't have to add a cabin. You can use another structure or build one from scratch, but in my case, to save time, I'll just grab one of the prefabs under Fortnite. So let's go to prefabs and then type in cabin. And we have a bunch of different options. Now I decide to settle on this cabin right here that I will drag out and place exactly at this location. I did some quick landscape sculpts to make the cabin better blend in with the environment and to prevent any rocks from going inside of the building. I also switched my view mode to unlit to help me see what I was doing. And if you really want, you can add in other buildings. For example, maybe there's a cabin up here, top of the hill. But in my case, I just wanted a single cabin because I imagine whoever lives there is doing it in solitude. They are trying to escape the city and just live in nature. Now it's time to add in some trees. So let's press control and space, select Fortnite and type in tree. We have a bunch of different trees. I want a tree that looks like it could be in the mountains, like the large pine 01 and the large pine 02. So both of them are really good. I also want smaller trees. So let's drag in this one. And also this one right here, although I'm going to scale it down. So it's not as big as our main tree. And there are also bushes I want to add. So let's type in bush. 
And it is this one right here, pretty big. So we can scale that down. And also this one that I like. I'm doing the process I did for the rocks. So I'm randomly placing these trees around the island. There's no rhyme or reason why I'm placing the trees where they are, just that I think it looks nice in those locations. Also, don't forget you could use the end key to drop an object to the floor and alt drag to duplicate an object. Placing foliage is tedious since oftentimes we have to place a lot of trees and shrubs if we are making a forest. In the future, UEFN will get foliage painter mode, which will make this process a lot easier, where we can just paint trees onto the landscape and not have to hand place them. Unreal Engine 5 already has that feature and I use that tool all the time. So I'm looking forward to when UEFN gets it. But until then, we have to hand place these assets. I also got some more assets. I typed in plants and brought in shrubs and ivy, which will make up my small detail. Generally, when making an environment, you want to handle the big features first, like the landscape and large trees. Once you have a good foundation or base to build off of, you can then start adding in small details like pebbles and shrubs. If you want to see what the island will look like at different times of the day, you can change it right here. So we can make this like it's early morning. I love this lighting. Or we can make it so that it's sunset. So the sun is setting right across this valley. And we can even make it the dead of night. So pretty spooky forest. The default value is 10. I will leave it at there for now. I think our environment is done. Personally, I could continue working on this environment for hours, just moving around objects or seeing how other assets might look. But this is a tutorial, so we have to move on. I encourage you to continue working on your island and to share your results. I look forward to seeing what everyone will make. Now let's create a game in the world we made. We're not gonna do anything too complicated. We're just gonna go over how different objects interact with each other. Now, in the future, I have a full video plan going over Unreal's custom programming language called Verse. With Verse, you could pretty much program anything. So look out for that video. Now, let's make the game. Okay, to begin, let's bring this environment into Fortnite. Just select Launch Session, and Fortnite will open up with this environment. And it looks like we spawned in water. So let me go exit out of Fortnite, go back into the editor, and that's because if we go all the way down here, we have the default floor and the default player spawners. And to better see this, since we're underwater and it's pretty blurry, go to lit and select unlit mode. So what I will do is, let me just delete all these floors since we don't need them. And also delete the player spawners because I can just re-add them all the way up here by typing in player spawn and drag it out and make sure the character is facing this direction. Since we want the player to initially look at that area. So now let's jump back into Fortnite. Double space to go into fly mode. That's why I can fly up. And this is where we ended up. Let's right click and start game. And now we spawn at the correct location facing the correct direction. And this is honestly really cool, but we can run around the environment that we've been working on for the past couple of hours. And honestly, it's one thing to create an environment. It's another thing to play your environment as if it's an actual game. And normally in Unreal Engine 5, it takes a while to get from the environment process to the game playing process because you actually have to create the characters and game dynamics with UEFN. It just works automatically. You can start playing in Fortnite like it's an actual game. Now back in UEFN, let's go over some basic object interactions with devices. So if I press control and space and go into devices, here we have a bunch of different gameplay elements that we can add to our world and they could even interact with each other. For example, I want my player to spawn immediately with an AR. So I will type in grant and drag in the item granter. So I'll just place it right there next to my player spawn. So with the item granter selected, within the details panel, I'm able to tell this device exactly what item I wanna grant the player. 
within the item list. So click on the plus button to add in a new item. And in the drop downs under item definition, you want to select an assault rifle. Let's go level two, just like that. Now, if we play our game, our player won't get anything. And that's because we have to tell our device exactly which player should get this item. And we do that with the functions right here. I want to click on the grant item. And then within the drop down, I'm going to select the player spawner. Or I can click on this eyedropper icon, select it, and then click on the player spawner right there to automatically select that. And we need to tell the device exactly what we wanted to do with the player spawner within the drop down right here. And that is grant an item on player spawned. So if we start our game, go back into Fortnite. Now we have a level two assault rifle ready to go within the game. So those are some basic interactions within Fortnite. Of course, we can get even more complicated interactions by programming entire games using verse scripting up here. But that's a tutorial for another day, since then this video would be another hour long. So let's go over another interaction that we can do. And that is with a button. So we find a button that the player can interact with if they press E. And what do we want this button to do? We want it to end the game because the player wins if they interact with the button. And we can use an end game device right here. So this little robot looking fella and spin it around. You'll also notice that since the robot is a widget, if I press the G key to hide all my game elements, this is what the player sees, then we no longer see that robot. And if I press the G key again, then we, the editors, can see it. So if you're ever trying to interact with a device and you don't see where it is, then press the G key to make sure your widgets are being shown. Now I want it, whenever the player presses the button, it ends the game in this device. So within the end game device, if I select that and let's scroll down in order to activate the device, we're going to add an element and it's specifically this button. And it's when this button is interacted with. So when the player presses the button, it's then going to send a signal to this device to end the game. So let me press on start and hopefully this works. All right, we can walk up to this button, press E, and it boots us out because we just won the game. Also, for the end game device, make sure you set winning team to activating team. That's how whatever player interacts with the button, that player's team will be the winner of the game. If you have ever used Fortnite Creative before, then you would know in the escape menu, we have the My Island settings. The My Island settings has all the different parameters and settings that are essential to whatever island or game we're creating. And it's important to know that we have these exact same settings within UEFN. So every time we create a new level or island within UEFN, we automatically get, if we go to search bar and type in island, the island settings. And if I press F, we could jump to that location. So it's all the way down there for quick and easy access. I will drag it. That's how it is right above my river, just like that. So if I expand the details panel, all the different settings within the island settings here are the exact same for the island settings within creative. For example, within UEFN, we can go down to time of day right here within island settings and change it to 12 a.m. And now our time of day changed. Or we can set it to, let's go 9 a.m. right there. For this island, I decided to leave it at 7 a.m. Because in my opinion, it looks like it has the best lighting. And by default, every island has a day-night cycle. So if you want to lock your lighting to a specific direction or time, you would have to do it in the island settings. And you'll also notice, since we deployed to Fortnite, we now know exactly how much memory this island takes up under project size. And right now it's telling us that it takes up 1% of the max amount of memory we can use, which is 400 megabytes. So there's a lot more that we can do to this map. So we can add a lot more to this map. The reason why this map's memory is so small being 1% is because we're only using Fortnite assets. So the user doesn't have to download that many assets 
to start playing the game. If we added custom assets or assets from Fab, then you can expect that 1% to balloon to something much higher. Now let's start working on the game and the game is going to be very simple. The player spawns in with an assault rifle and their goal is to simply make it into this house and click on the button that will be within this room. That's it. Although there will be enemies that the player has to fight. So we want the player to go in this direction. And this leads me onto my next topic and that is blocking volumes. So you don't want the player to just turn around and run into the ocean. In order to stop the player, we can add a blocking volume with the add button up here under volumes, blocking volume. So drag this out and we can scale this massive rectangle. That's so how it's right below the player. And now the player is stopped. Now, of course, the player can still go around this rock and then enter the ocean. I'm just placing it here as an example that you could go through and block off everywhere that you don't want the player to go. Now, I'm going to grab these devices and bring them into the room that I want the player to go into. I'm also going to clear this room. So let's delete all the assets that are already inside it and place the button right here on the wall. It's also important to know that we did not have to bring this device. This device could be anywhere as long as this device is referencing the button, which it is under functions, then we should be good. So I'll just leave the device underneath the floor. Also, it's kind of awkward there just being a button in this room and nothing else. Since this is the ending room, I think we should also add in some gold. So let's go to Fortnite and type in gold right here and place a bunch of bars everywhere. Maybe the story is that the guards outside the house are protecting the gold and your job is to eliminate all the guards and get to the gold, which means you win. All right, now let's add in some enemies. And to do that, if you ever use creative, then you know we will use the guard spawner and drag in that guard spawner right here. So actually, let's put this guard spawner right in front of the player so we know what it does. Now, if you use Fortnite Creative, then you already know all these settings right here within the details panel. But let's play our game to just see what the guards will do. So here we have a guard. And by default, they're not going to attack me. They also spawn in slowly. I don't want that to happen. I want the guards to spawn in automatically. So let's end game and jump back into UEFN. To make the guards hostile within the details panel under the advanced drop down, make sure they're on a separate team from the player. So instead of team index being one, change that to two. Also, as we destroy the guards, they will continually respawn. We don't want them to respawn. We want them to be a set amount of guards. So for example, let's say I only want four guards within this area. The spawn count is already set to four, but under advanced allow infinite spawn should be unchecked and the total spawn limit should be four or whatever the spawn count is up here. And to make sure the guards spawn all at once, scroll down to spawn timer and set that to zero. So now let's go test our game. And here we have exactly four guards. Are they going to attack me? And yes, they do. Now that I know the guard spawner is working, there are a few more changes I want to make. Number one, we could change the look of our guard to like something different. I'm going to pick IO. I think that looks the coolest. And for spawn counts, I only want two spawn from this. So I'll set total spawn limit and spawn count to two. Scroll down and something else I will change is accuracy. Change that to high because it looked like that they were missing a lot of shots point blank. We don't want that. And if you don't want your guards to spawn in this radius, maybe you want to be smaller or larger, you can increase the radius right here. So right now set to 10, you can set that to 20 to spawn a lot. Although be careful when you increase your spawn radius, since it's possible that guards can spawn, let's say inside of a rock or somewhere you don't want them to spawn. So then right here under spawn through walls, make sure that's unchecked. So I want two guards to spawn in this general location. So I'll add that right there. 
and I want another two guards to spawn over here and so that they don't fall into the water. Let me lower the spawn radius to 10. So they spawn right here. And hold down Alt. Let's go drag out some other guards and have two of them spawn over here. All right, let's double check everything's working. And that's weird. It looks like the guards immediately go into the water. Let's go double check that we have guards spawning up here. So we have two guards right there. But I think this might be an issue. Looks like we only have one guard right here. And here's another issue. That is we can destroy the water. So we also have to fix that. To start off, as you know, UEFN is based off of Fortnite. And one of the main draws of Fortnite is that pretty much every object is destructible. So this is great for Battle Royale, but we might not want that functionality for our own game. So to fix that, all you have to do is select any object you don't want destructible. And within the details panel, scroll all the way down here to can be damaged and turn that off. So now we cannot destroy the pond or the water right here. And let's say if I don't want this building to be destroyed, then I can select all the parts I don't want to be destroyed. And within details panel, turn off can be damaged. Now, I don't mind this building being destroyed, so I'll just leave that on, at least for now. And another issue is that we only had, it looked like, one guard spawning here. So if we check how many guards should spawn, it should be two. Which means that maybe a guard is spawning underwater, like at this location. So to fix that, let me decrease its spawn radius to five. And over here... It looks like the guards immediately walk towards where the guard spawner is. Instead, to fix that, let's change the spawn count to one. That's the only one guard will spawn from this. And decrease the spawn radius to 10. Now, I want one guard on one side of the river and another guard on the other side. Just like right here. Like that. And while we're at it, to make it easier for the player, let's add in a weapon they can pick up. So let's go to weapons and type in grenade and drag out a grenade launcher. So I'm going to place a grenade launcher right over here on top of this hill. And one issue with spawning weapons in Fortnite is that there's a timer. So you have to wait 10 seconds until you grab the weapon. I don't want that timer to happen. So within details panel, lower the time before first spawn to one. That's how after only one second, we can grab the gun. So with all those changes, let's play our game. And I think this is the final game. To begin our final game, the player has to take out the two henchmen down here. Just like that. And then they can run up here to go ahead and grab the grenade launcher, which is pretty overpowered. And use that against the enemies over there. That guy wasn't handled. And with the grenade launcher in hand, you can run up here and use it against these enemies. Now run across the waterfall. Over to the house, if I can run up here. Enter it, and now we have the gold. Luckily, the grenade launcher didn't destroy the gold and press the button to win the game. Now that our game is complete, you know everything to get started using Creative 2.0. Not only do you know how to use UEFN, you also know the basics of Unreal Engine 5. This is because UEFN is a simpler version of UE5. If you're interested in learning Unreal Engine 5, I have a separate channel called Unreal Sensei. You can check it out in the description. There you can learn how to create your own games outside of Fortnite and preview new features like foliage painting before they release for UEFN. Also, make sure to subscribe for more UEFN videos planned for the future. Now, with all that being said, I'll see you in the next video.